Hello and welcome to Conversations in Clean Tech, the podcast that celebrates the clean tech industry and the people that power it, brought to you by Brightsmith. For our seventh season, we're speaking to clean tech leaders about the process of investing in a cleaner planet. From inspiring stories and words of wisdom to financial forecast and investment insights, you can learn all about the people and companies who are driving these investments and propelling us towards a cleaner, greener tomorrow. I'm your regular host, Jenny Gladman, but this season there's a twist. I'll be taking a few months off to have my second baby. So I'm handing the reins of our podcast over to a series of fellow Brightsmithers who will be season seven's super co-hosts. So without further hesitation, Hello and welcome. I'm Nick, the leader of our e-mobility team here at Brightsmith, and I'll be hosting today's episode of Conversations in Clean Tech. On today's podcast, I'll be chatting to the managing director of Teva Hydrogen Electric Trucks, Ken Scott. Ken's a seasoned expert with over 35 years of experience in the automotive industry. We're definitely in for an interesting talk today to learn all about Ken's journey, his thoughts on the industry and where it's headed. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, Pleasure to meet you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, look, before we get stuck into the industry talk, it would be great to hear a bit more about your story and a bit more about you. Sure. Um, My name's Ken Scott, as you said. I've been with Teva for three years. I originally joined as the chief engineer. Um, I have, uh, as you said, and thanks for the reminder, had over, um, I'll say, 37 years now in in automotive. I've been um, with Land Rover. I've been with Bentley Motorcars. I spent some time in Volkswagen Group. And I work for a company called Alexander Dennis as well, who make buses and coaches. Um, I live in Cheshire with my partner. I've got two grown-up sons. And my uh, fun time is spent uh, attempting to play golf. I, uh, I also support uh, football. I, well, love watching football. My cross that I have to bear is that my hometown team is Dundee United. We're doing all right at the moment, but uh, early days. And uh, yeah, I enjoy w- watching rugby and spending time with friends. I, w- I would say overall, happiness is, is, is key in life, as we all know. And finding the right balance between all the opportunities to have fun and all the challenges is key. Um, so right now, I've got it completely wrong. But anyway, <laughs> well, I absolutely agree on that. And it's it's always great to hear a bit about what you like to do outside of work as well. I think that work life balance piece is always really important. But on to the um, industry talk then. Tell us about your role at Teva and, and what you're doing there. Yeah, we, we were actually as a business established um, 11 years ago now. I joined three years ago originally as, as, as chief engineer, and I'm now managing director. Um, since uh, October last year. My focus as MD is the scale up of the Teva business and becoming an established OEM, uh, making sure we're at the forefront of truck decarbonization. So that navigation of Teva um, from startup to scale up uh, has, comes with its challenges, as you can imagine, and I'm sure we'll get into some of these. It's a, certainly, I'd describe it to anybody as a roller coaster ride uh, while we establish ourselves. But, but the phases that we've um, gone through, uh, if you like, in our approach to this is that we we won our project a few years ago to supply UPS with, with some vehicles. That allowed us to learn about battery design, about the various control systems and software around battery designs, and also allowed us to understand how the customers of, of these sort of vehicles operate, what they're looking for, etc. That's now, these vehicles have now completed in, in total over 600,000 kilometres. And it's allowed us then to take all of that learning and, and apply it to the next uh, sort of phase of our journey, which is the seven and a half tonne truck that we're scaling up in production right now. So we, we have got whole vehicle type approval for, for that and we've started to sell them to customers. We've recently um, won awards um, for this um, due to the fact that we've demonstrated real world carbon reduction in logistics with vehicles in operation, getting great results and and fantastic feedback. But the story is not going to end there. Uh, Clearly, we need to to further expand that and apply it and get more customers operating these vehicles. But then ultimately, we're going to develop a a hydrogen dual energy product. Hydrogen dual energy, why? Because it's the the, the best way to optimize between range, payload and and cost for, for a truck. We're a very real purpose-driven company and very value-led in the culture that we are establishing here. And I think that's very important to, uh, to, to 
is something I'm, I'm very proud of in, in what we're establishing. Our mission, basically, we do technology because it matters and makes a difference to humanity. Sustainability uh, is, is built into the design. Uh, we've got a regenerative braking system um, and an e-motor system that, that captures energy uh, that's normally lost to heat uh, and then adds it back into the, to, to the battery. Our e-motor has no rare earth materials in it, um, which makes it very, you know, in terms of the credentials for, for sustainability, absolutely the sort of thing that we need to develop. Obviously, we're zero emissions at the tailpipe. And we have a, a battery program in place with the global leader in battery recycling for first battery life management into a second life. And again, all of these credentials are, make it really, really important to be true to our word in terms of what we're trying to do and our mission as we scale up uh, as a business. Amazing. It's so great to hear about all the opportunities within you know, to decarbonize logistics and decarbonize trucking and what you're taking advantage of and, and where you'll go from here. So great to hear the enthusiasm there. And, and with that in mind, what would you say have been the biggest achievements so far in Teva? I'm still here. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from a <laughs> putting that aside, from a technology perspective, I mentioned it earlier, achieving European whole vehicle type approval is a credit to, to the team that we have and a, a little startup business. That's a massive achievement to be able to do all of the testing, everything that's required to get that. And certifying the first electronic braking system with ZF. We're a major automotive supplier, and, and for us as a little company to, to, to go through, you know, working with that sort of organization was a major challenge. We're very proud of, of the in-house sort of battery manufacturing capabilities that we've built up and the fact that we've, we've done a lot of the software controls ourselves. And recently, we put our very first prototype hydrogen electric vehicle on the road. And it drove all the way from Tilbury to Scotland and back again without recharge of the batteries, which has absolutely demonstrated the capabilities and why ultimately the answer is, is something like that. I think from a wider mission uh, perspective, I mentioned earlier about the 7.5 tonne truck. It's on, on target to save 12 tonnes of CO2 in one year of operation. Now, it depends, obviously, on the customer operation. I think it can actually save more than that for some customers. But that's a little a little glimpse that if you multiply that up, that's going to have a, a major, major benefit to the planet in terms of uh, the mission that we, we have. So uh, I, I think, lastly, I would say the, the biggest achievement is the, the team that we built up in Teva. We've had huge ups and downs, as you can imagine, in that, that process and challenges to deal with but but what we've created here and the team that we've got here is pretty special amazing and yeah it's it's great to hear again the enthusiasm there particularly about the um almost the proof of concept there with the hydrogen tr truck demonstrating that range is not an issue so so great to hear that and 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 I'm looking forward to seeing where that develops i think we all know as well there's um a lot of challenges, particularly within the the e-mobility industry, trucking industry in particular at the moment. What are some of the challenges that you've had to deal with? Um, how long is the podcast? Um, right, so um, <laughs> what, working on the business as well as in the business has been, a, been a, a personal challenge. Investing in developing the right culture and finding the right people and talent, etc., is absolutely key to success and it's definitely been a challenge. Attracting and retaining people in a startup takes a special type of person to, to be willing to take up that sort of uh, challenge. It's much safer to go, you know, in lots of other traditional built up established OEMs. So this is not for the faint hearted by any stretch. It's a risk, but the rewards in terms of being part of the success story that this, this is um, turning out to be. Um, it's huge as we grow the business. In terms of challenges, investment and funding, absolute minefield. I'm sure we'll probably touch on that in detail a little bit uh, later. And then from a technology and product development point of view, that constant balancing act between payload and cost and range and finding solutions that find some sort of optimum solution between all these is a, is a constant battle. As a little company, offering a credible solution to our customers in terms of an after-sales solution is key. 
Um, we've partnered with a, a, a very uh, renowned uh, company in this sphere, Old Truck, and I think that's taken a lot of stress off of us being able to work with somebody like that for something like, like that a small company would struggle with traditionally. I could go through the rest of this podcast about some of the supply chain issues that we've had um, over the past uh, couple of years or so, but I've said enough. And ultimately... You know, our product has got to stand the test of a business case in the face of our customers and they, they make low margins in this business. So, so you know, doing a lot to, to try and make sure this is an attractive proposition, not just as a sustainable solution, but as a business solution. How do you personally keep motivated in the face of all the challenges that, that you are facing on a day-to-day <laughs> basis? How do I keep motivated? Good question. I guess my main thing is... is you know, why I joined um, the business in the first place. I spent quite a bit of time, as you know, in the automotive industry. Like all of us, I've I've become increasingly aware of the change in the environment and can see it's real, it's affecting us in different ways. I, you know, watch the news all the time. I watch all the documentaries about it and it's, I mean, I'll admit it, it's quite, it affects me and it's quite depressing that, that that's where we are. Um, so I feel like some of the products that I've been involved in actually over my career, some small part, are, are contributing to that. So I feel like I need to do something about it. So uh, and, I, and I obviously I have two sons, as I said, and you know I'm looking at future generations, etc. And, and I think yeah, well, I can make a difference here, and hopefully bring a team of people with me to to create products that people will be interested in that can scale up and 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 stop the 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 CO2 impact on, on um, well, it's not on the planet, because actually I would, I would argue the planet will survive this. It's humanity that won't, and, and that's what we've got to really consider. So that's what motivates me. It's a bigger purpose. Yeah, absolutely, and it's so common for, for, for those of us in the industry to really have that, that environmental feeling behind the, our motivation to continue in the sector. And, and it's great to hear. And is, is that what originally inspired your move into the decarbonisation side of the industry? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's it. Um, I could feel like, um, you know, 37 years, uh, um, I've, 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 I think I would say I've known enough during that time about the, the product creation cycle for a new product, etc. And, and, and you know, I was very keen to apply it on something that is going to make a difference to, uh, to the, the, the impact on the environment. Amazing. And with that in mind, we are constantly speak to a lot of people who want to get stuck into the industry, have the same feelings about you know, wanting to use their skills to be able to you know, contribute to a, to a greener future. What, what lessons that you've learned could you share with those also shaping their journeys in the sector? No matter how hard you think it's going to be to get things done, I can guarantee it'll be 10 times tougher and 10 times longer. <laughs> I would say a number of things here. Investors need investment. And by that, what I mean is you've got to look after them. They, they, they don't, don't expect the investors to be knocking on your door and, and feeding in lots of cash at no cost. The cost is is your own, you know, uh, the way that you you uh, present to them and convince them of what this is all about, and why you know their their money is is a sound investment in something um, that, that ultimately is going to give them a return. So investors need investment. Conserving cash and a lean, agile operation is key. There is no point over investing at the start. You've got to scale things step by step and be very, very careful. Every penny counts. Treat the money as your own. Um, it's, you know, all these things, it's really, really important. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately you will be able to scale up and add in the, you know, automotive technology you would expect but but right now you know take it a step at a time what's appropriate reliability is absolutely key to customer satisfaction yeah they want a zero emission product they want to try it etc but if it doesn't work <laughs> forget it <laughs> you know you, so so reliability of our products is absolutely key i would say a lesson don't rely on on lots of of government infrastructure or incentivization in the industry it's good there is some but it ain't going to save you bacon so so you know <laughs> um, 
and you can spend an awful long time trying to lobby people to uh, to, to to support that, and well, not, not you know, lose concentration and focus on on the things that will actually you know get there. I think, lastly, be resilient. No matter what gets in your way, there's always a way through it. Just keep going, keep going. You'll find a solution. Absolutely. I think the resilience there is such a key point. And as well as that, when you talk about the overinvestment, it's it's those companies at the moment that have overinvested and perhaps run run a bit faster than they can walk, which are suffering at the moment. So absolutely some really important lessons there. And And when it comes to the investment piece, as you know, the theme of this podcast season is investing in a cleaner future. So it would be interesting to learn your thoughts on the trends and observations you've made when it comes to investment in the sector. Sure. I mean, again, I would say a few years ago, maybe as recently as two years ago, up to two years ago, it was actually easier to get investment in this in this sector. There was a lot of, of companies trying to get into this and, and, and successfully getting huge amounts of investment. But now um, there's a bit of a graveyard of, of, of failed startups in this industry. I could talk about Dyson, uh, Arrival, Volta, uh, British Volt, uh, Proterra, uh, Lordstown, just to name but a few. And there's, there's, you know, it's too depressing to, to go through it. And well, they've all attempted things in this sector and successfully got got funding. But what is it? You know why? Um, are they in the graveyard right now? Is it something to do with overambition? Is it is it uh, you know ultimately a lack of funding or poor cash and priority management? I don't know. I I I can't get involved in that too much. I've got to concentrate on 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 Teva if you like. But I certainly see that 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 is key to success um, from from what I can glean from 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 others i think um looking at it going forward i hinted at, at um, incentivization as being being key i'm not looking at incentivization for the businesses it's more for our customers to actually um, purchase our products in the us though they have for example introduced the what they call the ira um, don't get confused it's not what you think it's the inflation reduction act it is uh, all about investing in uh, zero emission manufacturing technology start you know getting um, production in the US and that's a fantastic government initiative that is spawning a whole load of things on the back of it and again you sort of question is there something in that that, that could help uh, in the UK if we had a similar type of, a, of approach and in terms of incentivization of our, our customers to buy products the UK has a, has a thing called the plug-in truck grant that gives a maximum of £16,000 towards the purchase of a zero emission vehicle that, that is certified uh, to, to comply with this. The Teva vehicle, fortunately, is compliant with that. But to put in context, £16,000 is about a quarter of what I could get in Germany if I was to sell a product in Germany where I can get 80% of the difference between a diesel truck and an EV truck funded by the government as a customer. So, you know, I think we all need to look at that and start to, to um, walk the talk, so to speak, in terms of creating the right sort of environment um, for these products to be uh, to be bought by our customers. Absolutely, and some really important points there. And, you know, it's, it's definitely been a challenge for some of the companies to to secure the investment they need. As you mentioned, there's there's some companies that have unfortunately fallen down as a result of that. With all of that in mind, how do you see that the, the sort of investment situation changing in the coming years without asking you to predict the future? <laughs> yeah, if I could do that, I'd be, uh, <laughs> I'd be picking the lottery numbers this week. But um, yeah, so I mean, let's begin in the UK. I still believe that the UK has got a fantastic opportunity. We are very, very innovative in, in what we come up with. The, the, you know, the, the things that we're involved in this country around innovation in, in EV technology is absolutely superb. There's some, some great centres and some great government-funded initiatives that are helping with that. You know, the Innovate UK, for example, extremely supportive in this, in this field. And the more that we can do to, 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 to set that spark going of the idea or the catalyst or whatever through that sort of thing, then, then fantastic. But I think it now needs to move on to the next phase. 
we're great at innovation. I would have to say we're not so good as in the UK when it comes to manufacturing when you compare to other countries. Localised manufacturing is absolutely key if we're going to find truly sustainable solutions. My view is that we need to also, apart from innovation, be looking at how we can incentivise manufacturing setup in this country. Globally, we need to accelerate the reduction in CO2 and other emissions from, from what we do. So how can we help to incentivize that investment to be the catalyst in this sector? There's got to be something we can do here to try to shoehorn um, a lot of investment to, in, in, into this. And having said all of that, without what I would describe as collaborative politics um, across the globe, it's going to be difficult. And at the right now, for the next 12 months, as we, as we know, things are going to change. We've got a quarter of the world's population are going to be voting. So, so whoever's in power now, <laughs> maybe in power in 12 months time or maybe something different and that whole landscape of of how we drive this forward is therefore going to change but you know i think it could be changed for the better if, if we truly truly grab this opportunity to have a positive impact on the environment absolutely and it will truly take a global effort to make a positive change here so so let's hope we can um start to see some some positive results going forward both politically and and um, in the investment world, I mean, for the investment world is particularly tricky at the moment. And and as you rightly point out, there's it, it's all about in, incentivizing that investment at the moment, and how we can make sure that um, companies are getting enough investment to be able to continue. Um, how how's your personal experience been when it comes to seeking investment within Teva? Minefield. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other thing I would say is the long and winding road is is is, is what you're talking about here. And so so I think you know we we've had a couple of occasions where where the best analogy I can use is that we've been been up to the up the aisle and ready to put a ring on the finger, then turned around and they were gone. And and it's like you know it's such a such a, a, a tortured uh, process. And it's not until the absolute uh, nailed on agreement is in place, anything can go wrong. Um, so it's, it's been, been a tough uh, battle. So the way I've, I've looked at it, it's, um, I'm going to simplify it slightly, but, but you're always looking at, at short term things, medium term things and long term things. Surprise, surprise, you know, and I see it almost like plate spinning. The short term, I'm talking about days to weeks is, is like, what do we get? How can we get leverage? Uh, in existing investors, etc., to, to continue to to support the business, and um, and that is absolutely key. So that that plate's spinning away like mad, and its focus is in you know days to weeks. Then what I, we have this sort of medium term, that's weeks to months, um, and that's again is is looking at new investors are going to come in and add to this and 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 join the club of existing. And now you get these long term ones, and these are the ones that are quite tortured processes that are six months plus, six months, 12 months even to, to get over the line. And they all, you know, you've just got to keep pl uh, spinning the plates, keep keep them going. And uh, yeah, it, one or two of them will fall off, but quite a few, you know, one or two of them will actually keep going. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's something to celebrate when you get to the end of the process, whether it is short, medium or long term, when you actually something lands and you can you can get going again and i think the key challenge is how do you satisfy their desire for a return versus the ability to grow the business and whilst plotting your way through this minefield you know they look they're not putting in the money for fun or necessarily purely for the the mission of the business yes that's a key factor but at the end of the day <laughs> they're looking for a return um, and uh, you know there's a lot of pressure on us to to demonstrate how we will get to that return point Absolutely. And I think with all those plates spinning in the air and so much going on at once, I've got no doubt you've learned some lessons, some things you might have done differently, some things you might have wanted to change. I mean, what, what advice can you give for the people and companies who are searching for investment at the moment? Stay strong. <laughs> Be resilient. <laughs> resilient is that word again. Find a coping mechanism. I would say for the inevitable uncertainty that you're going to be dealing with. It's, it's, you know, there's going to be a lot of times when you're not sure what's going to happen, where it's going to go. 
you need to, to, to be able to deal with that type of situation, find coping mechanisms, as I say, of how you do it. And everybody's different. Everybody does it in, in different ways. So I think it's important as well that when you get um, interest or when you're looking for interest in, in investment, speak to whoever. <laughs> speak to them and be ready, but be ready to apply a filter quite quickly. You have to be upfront, clear, and, and uh, you know, do the the due diligence and the proof of funds as quickly as possible so that we know you know whether it's real or not and how quickly they can can make things real before you launch into the the the, the, the official processes if you like because there's no point in wasting energy and stress on things that, that then are not going to happen absolutely and i think yeah building that resilience piece like you said early on in the podcast whether it's following dundee united or, or golfing is key and everyone needs to have that that balance so it's not just work 24 7 there's always things to 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 be considering on the outside of that and moving on from the sort of investment side then when it comes to the ev market in general what's what's your take on the state of the market especially in terms of the challenges and opportunities we'll face over this year and the coming years well being an optimist uh, first and foremost i I find it extremely exciting I, i think it's the place to be right now there's so much going on there's so much opportunity the world needs it as i talked about earlier and i do feel that the drive is starting to 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 make this happen i think the momentum is starting to 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 pick up but again you know it challenges inevitably infrastructure i'm bound to say that but having charge points they, they are becoming more plentiful and our our truck tend to our trucks tend to charge in and depot electricity overnight so it's not needing that expensive uh, infrastructure upgrades etc so looking into the future more technology advances are are, are on the horizon which are going to make the transition uh, even more attractive for for our customers but we can't wait around forever postponed perfection is 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 something that we can't afford as a as a as humanity to wait for let's get on it let's start uh, learning in the same way that a few years ago EV cars were starting to be adopted by people and understood, etc. They weren't perfect, but but they started to be accepted. And and look at us now with it was it about twenty odd percent of 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 sales of, of all new cars being EVs right now. So you know the technology is there um, in 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 our industry to be trialed, to be tested, and and start to be adopted. So so let's let's do it. Any particular tech technology that you think will really start to enhance um, uptake of EVs? Yeah, I think uh, two things. Uh, it's all around batteries, but, but you know, more energy-dense battery technology and the ability to have fast charging capability um, are the, 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 the two things. And, and doing all of that without a hit on, on, on weight too much or on cost too much uh, are going to be key advances in my view. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Cost is such a key one. As soon as we start to see the cost really being driving, driven down, it's a no-brainer for people to start using EVs. So hopefully we'll we'll start to see that. And with all of that in mind, how do you see Teva fitting into that and evolving over the next few years? I, I think the, the good thing is we can fit in immediately. We have a product that's oven ready. We're ready to go. We're ready to build up. We're ready to, to, to hand over to customers and, and, and start scaling up. So I think overall, we've got around a two to three year window as a business to, to really, really take off um, and get customer uh, experience of our product, of our brand, of our people, of how we manage situations, etc., with them. And offer a product that that is going to you know be attractive to them for the longer term, before the more traditional OEMs will will come into the market and and you know they're going to have some fantastic products. Right now they're not quite there, and I'd see a a, a bit of a window of opportunity for us before they, they they come to market. But as I said earlier about the, our product plans, the the combination of hydrogen etc. I think we've got some really exciting stuff to, to bring to market and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Amazing. It's so exciting and we're all really excited to see how the company develops and continues to go from strength to strength. And lastly, the last question we like to ask all of our guests is for your clean tech token of wisdom. What advice can you give to others for success in the rapidly evolving field of clean tech? Be brave, be tenacious, 
never give up on the bumpy ride that's going to be ahead of you. Be optimistic. Lead with innovation, I'd say, is, is, is really, really key. Build the right team around you. Inspire with sustainability. And cultivate a culture of, of collaboration between both internally and with external stakeholders, whether that's the uh, customers, investors, etc. But overall, you, you just got to keep focused on why. Um, so in, in green technology industry, your vision can power the world towards a, a brighter, cleaner future. Keep remembering that. Keep focused on it and you'll overcome barriers. Amazing. And I love that focus on the long term vision, it's something I will always keep focused on as well. And, and that's, I think, all we have time for today overall. But I'd like to say thanks very much for the insightful chat, Ken. No doubt we'll continue to see Teva going from strength to strength. And, and thanks for being a great guest. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, yeah, hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks very much.